Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Hai Thank you, Alia Jan. Welcome again, friends, from wherever you may be around the world, morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to Rayfest, our first online festival celebrating women of spirit. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Saima Daya, and together with Fatima Ashraf, we are the co-creators of Ray of God. Ray seeks to share feminine spiritual wisdom to help realize God in all ways and to align with justice, truth, and beauty. The energetic state of the feminine is our guiding principle and holds our intention. And we believe that all genders hold the feminine and masculine within themselves. While we are women-led and women-centered, we welcome and encourage all genders to join us in a safe, inclusive space, God willing. Ray does not seek to present a voice of expertise. We see ourselves as travelers along the way and learning with each step. Our ideas are constantly evolving and we hope you will join us on this journey to deeper consciousness. So the aim of this festival is to heal, harmonize and challenge. And our contributors will be speaking to the broad theme of her space, how women create and claim or reclaim sacred or other spaces, literally and through reshaping narratives and giving voice to their views and experience as they discover their power and agency as women. We are blessed to be welcoming over the course of this weekend a truly diverse, intergenerational, interspiritual cohort of incredible contributors. Some of these are religious leaders, some spiritual teachers, activists, academics, creatives, and so much more. So now I'd like to introduce our spiriting sheroes for this session. First up, we have the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, who is the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries and Operations in the United Church of Christ and Co-Executive for Global Ministries with the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. She's an inspiring preacher and theologian and shares her skills and gifts in a variety of settings, nationally and internationally, often using her poetry as a part of her ministry. Her ecumenical and interreligious commitments have overlapped with her interest and implementation of global consultations on multiple religious belongings. 
Her leadership in this area has created opportunities for dialogue in the church and created safe space for engaging the variety of expressions of religious multiplicity. Her book of poetry, Drums in Our Veins, um, was meant to be published in 2020. I'm not sure what's happened, what the timeline for that is, but I'm sure she can let us know. And it's a compilation of poems that focuses on the injustices facing people of African descent and the fight and desire for racial justice globally. She was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and her poetry and writings reflect her Jamaican heritage and culture, as well as the traditions and law of her ancestors. And I highly recommend that you check out her blog, bytherivers13.com. Um, it's, um, I, I read a piece on there called Antonyms of Complicity. I just love that title. Um, it just evokes so much and I really recommend that you check that out. And she also has um, some recitations of her poems on YouTube. Maybe she'll speak some more about that later. She's on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Twitter, so no nonsense. And Instagram, Karen underscore Georgia. So do check that out. And our second wonderful speaker is Shireen Kankan, a sociologist of religion and philosophy. She's among the world's 100 most pioneering, inspirational and influential women. That was BBC 2016, and I would certainly agree with all of that. She is the founder and leader of the Exit Circle, Denmark's first self-help group against mental violence and negative social control. She launched the organization Fem Imam to advocate for the inclusion of women functioning as imams in Denmark. And in 2016, she became the founder and leader of the Mariam Mosque, the first mosque in Scandinavia with female imams. I'm sure most of you will have heard about that because it was pretty sensational across the world. And The Reformist is a documentary about the making of the Mariam Mosque um, that was uh, made by uh, Marie Skovgaard. Um, which is highly worth checking out. The Maryam Mosque works to promote female Muslim leadership, a separation between religion and politics, and a spiritual approach to Islam. And her most recent book is Women Are the Future of Islam. It's a beautiful, intimate, um, remarkable uh, book. It's not long and you will zip through it. So you can find out more about Shireen um, on femimam.com. Um, you can read the Muslim manifesto that she has on there. And also on Instagram, she's, she's under Mariam Mosque, Exit Circlen, C-I-R-K-L-E-N, and also as Shireen Kankan. So without further ado, I'm going to um, ask these wonderful speakers to share with us. And I just realized that I haven't actually brought up the questions, which I will need because my brain will not be able to hold all this information. Here we are. So. The first question that I'd like to pose, and we'll ask Karen Georgia to open up for us, is what does the sacred feminine mean to you and how do you see her helping us to heal, harmonize, and challenge the hegemonic worldview? Thank you. So um, for me, the divine feminine is um, extremely important. Um, as a Christian minister, I'm ordained in the, uh, in the Christian church, um, it is not um, historically a prevalent um, reference that we see. And yet um, in scripture, there are multiple places and references to the divine feminine, um, particularly since in Christianity, we do use the Hebrew scriptures as well as the, the gospels. Um, the Hebrew scriptures um, speak quite extensively to the presence of the feminine divine. So for me, um, one of the places where that contextualizes is an understanding in Christian theology of um, all being made in divine image. And if we go with that as a central um, piece of um, understanding about um, who we are um, as created in God and in God's image, then it says to me that the divine feminine is present and that that is reflected also in my presence and in who I am and in what I bring. Um, so so the, the idea and, and notions of, um, of, of God as, as masculine or God as only masculine um, deteriorate 
I think the personhood of women and has done so for an extended period of time and supports a more patriarchal worldview. So, um, so being able to, um, to recover um, that understanding of divine feminine is important for me as a Christian. I'm also a person of African descent. And um, as a person of African descent, um, I am recovering um, the traditions of my foremothers and forefathers brought into, um, into my context, which is the Caribbean, um, as a part of the transatlantic slave trade. And those are still present for us. And they inform my own understanding of God and the feminine, femininity of the divine. So the divine feminine for me is very much rooted in my African cosmology. Um, and in particular, um, around Ifa and, and Yoruba tradition um, that, that speaks to the manifestations of the divine and calls on Oya, Yamaya, Oshun, and, and others and, and name the divine feminine in ways that are tangible and allow for access. I think that, um, to kind of get to um, to the other part of your question about healing, um, I think it's important because so much, um, especially for women, um, there there is so much that pushes back against who we are, um, um, just in terms of of presence, right? Um, and and regardless of where we think we are in our process, right? We still need to move into spaces of decolonizing and um, and diminishing the patriarchal ways in which we've understand the world, understand understood women, understood female presence, understood leadership, understood power, all of that. And so I think a recovery of the divine feminine and an understanding and walking in the divine feminine, I think is a way of healing the planet, right? Um, because um, I think also that there's a dualistic approach that that um, that compartmentalizes male and female as if they're you know two separate um, things and and the truth is that we all embody um, some of what we deem to be masculine and feminine and so um, I think that holding um, that wholeness and fullness of who we are um, becomes important. So this hegemonic worldview, which is which is again a very patriarchal construct, right? Um, and 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 names um, um, uh, a destructive um, masculinity um, has to be um, rejected in order for us to um, to move into a different way of understanding what the world is. And I think that a part of um, a part of the um, the the, um, the the piece about moving forward in in terms of um, of divine feminine and and worldview is that traditional understanding of of nurturing that comes out of the feminine right um, and and that wisdom that is very much um, what we call um, in African um, descendant tradition, mother wit, that kind of wisdom that we value. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for ch touching upon the really important um, aspect that we're trying to hold in Ray, which is masculine and feminine are attributes and energies. And regardless of what gender you are, you will incorporate these and hold them within you. Um, such a huge topic. and. We could carry on, but um, uh, thank you for opening that. Shireen? Salam alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, walaikum salam. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Are you asking me the same question? Yes, please. Yes. Um, when I was a very young girl, um, I was brought up in a family with... Um, my mother, uh, she's Christian and from Finland. And she, she came to Denmark uh, because she couldn't find work as a nurse in Finland. My father, he's a political refugee from Syria. So after uh, having been jailed and tortured, he, he escaped and he came to Denmark as a political refugee. 
uh, they met each other uh, in Copenhagen and my father proposed to my mother the first time he saw her. He saw her twice the same day. And of course she said no, but they married after a month and they're still married today. Uh, I was brought up in a family where my parents succeeded in uniting East and West Christianity and Islam. And they both have a, a spiritual approach to their religion. They're both practicing uh, Muslim and Christian. Uh, my father, um, I always saw him as um, a person who has this uh, feminine uh, energy. And he always used to quote uh, Ibn Arabi since I was a very young girl. He quoted Ibn Arabi and he introduced me to the, to the literature of Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi uh, is one of the reformators within the Sufi tradition, which is this, the mystical or spiritual path within Islam. Uh, he lived from 1165 until 1240. And uh, my father quoted him saying, the perfect man is a woman. And I was really inspired by that quotation. And it's really a part of my poetic childhood memory. And um, Ibn Arabi, he's, he, through his literature, he challenged um, patriarchal structures, patriarchal readings of the Quran and um, very uh, dogmatic interpretations of gender. So I was inspired by that. I remember um, when I read the Quran, uh, maybe I, I read it so many times, but I, I realized by reading it when I was younger that all the chapters in the Quran, they except for one chapter that is chapter nine but all the chapters they begin with in the name of god the merciful the compassionate um bismillah ar-rahman rahim so the the two terms ar-rahman and ar-rahim they both descend from rahma uh, which is uh, it means mercy, merciful, but it also means endless flood of mercy or sensitivity. And it also refers to the, to the womb um, that carries the child. So Allah's most important attribute, the mercy, mercy is uh, rooted in the, the woman's womb. And I think that's uh, really beautiful and the term Ar-Rahman, it means that Allah is merciful no matter what we do. Allah's mercy is everywhere. And we as people, we cannot contain the mercy that Allah contains because we're humans. And the term Ar-Rahim, it means that if we take one step towards Allah, Allah will come running to us or God will come running to us. And they both steam from, from the womb and like God is merciful no matter what we do and Allah shows the mercy according to our actions in the same way we as women we carry the child in our womb and so we we carry life and we give life so I think that's a very beautiful beautiful metaphor and I I used it um, both uh, metaphorically but also very practically I um, I was inspired to implement um, the feminine through my activism. And it actually started back in 2000 when I was doing my thesis in Syria. I remember I was sitting in the Abu Nur Mosque, which is the greatest center for Sunni Islamic activism in Syria. I was listening to the Friday prayer of the Grand Mufti, Sheikh Ahmed Kuftaru. And I was sitting with all the women at the balcony, looking down at the Grand Mufti and thousands of people were, they wanted to be close to him, to touch his clothes. And, and I was thinking, what would it be like if the Grand Mufti was a woman or if the Imam was a woman? And how come that we as people, I mean, have normalized a patriarchal structure all over the world, in all the mosque communities, in our religious communities. How come that we have normalized this structure? And, and I started to ask the women, uh, all the great women that I was sitting next to, um, and I asked them, could you consider yourself a female imam? And they all said yes, but they said, but in order to become a female imam, 
you need to have the same knowledge as the Grand Mufti. You need to be close to the Grand Mufti and none of us are. And of course, that I don't believe that's true. I believe that we have so many, within our history, we have so many great women um, as an inspiration to manifest the feminine in, in our practical daily life. So when I came back to Copenhagen, I, I decided to start the first uh, Muslim organization in Denmark that was in August 2001. Uh, it was the first Muslim organization with a female Muslim leadership. And we were advocating then, back then in 2000, uh, for we had a vision of creating a mosque one day with female imams, with women calling to prayer, leading the prayer and delivering the khutbah. And, today in or in 2016 we implemented the vision and the alia who uh, who called to prayer today she's one of the female imams in the maria mosque and i oh sorry what does that mean five what does that mean sorry saima is my Wait. time yeah just it's, you come to five minutes if you just want to to close okay okay i, I will close now so my point was that um i believe that in order to, to heal our societies, we need to implement our knowledge into activism. So I believe that, that that's one of the greatest um, tools in order to heal things. We have to implement our knowledge in activism because we can have a lot of conferences and we can have a lot of talks about what to do, but things will stay the same until we change things on the ground through our daily activism. Thank you, Shireen, so much. Um, actually, that really beautifully ties into the next question, um, which is which is about activism. So um, maybe you could just uh, continue um, and speak to the fact that there appears to be a rise in spiritual activism. And how do you see the feminine and the feminine voice uh, in particular in relation to activism? How has she affected your activism? Do you want me to continue, Saima? Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I remember that, uh, I, I mean, within the Islamic tradition, everything starts with the, with the human voice. And the human voice is, I mean, the call to prayer, it's a human voice. It was a black slave, Bilal, who called to prayer in 600 in Medina. And that's quite significant to think about if we think about historically how we have treated um, black people and still there is a hierarchy and there is so much dis discrimination all over the world. So I believe that within the Islamic tradition, we have um, a spiritual potential in order to deconstruct all the manipulated dichotomies that we people have created between men and women, uh, black and whites, rich and poor, and so, so this is what I think is possible through activism. So by creating a mosque, by um, when, we ha when we in Denmark, when we develop from a movement into an institution, creating a mosque, we were able to implement the call to prayer at a systematical level. And I think that's extremely important because all around the world we hear men's voices calling to prayer. And it is significant. It is significant to think about that the female voice is, um, is silent. It's not represented and it matters. So by having women calling to prayer, that in itself is a, is a huge manifestation of, the, of, of how to introduce the feminine through the activism. It's not unimportant. It, I, I know that it's all about Allah, it's all about worshiping the one, but how we worship the one is also important. It's not insignificant. And when we had our first Friday prayer, and I, I, I called to prayer the first Friday prayer, we had around 70 women in the mosque and we, we could sense that there was a, a, a emotional, um, emotional uh, light revolution because a lot of women, they missed the sound of the female voice. So, 
And also, it's not unimportant who delivers the chutbah, because the chutbah is a very important tool in order to define Islam in, our, in a daily context. In the Maryam Mosque, we, we have a specific focus on rereading the Quran with a focus on gender equality. We introduce all the stories that are left untold, the stories about Aisha and Um Salama, who called to prayer in the first house mosque in the Islamic civilization after the death of the Prophet. We, we tell the stories left untold about the Prophet appointing Umaraka to lead the prayer for her household because she was the most excellent in reciting and, and because of her knowledge uh, with Islam. So at least three women were acting as female imams at the time of the prophet and just after he died in Medina in year 600. These are stories that are left untold. So, and these are the stories that we need to tell, but we don't only need to tell them, we also need to, 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 to tell them through our activism. When we started the mosque, people told us that um, female imams is not a possibility. It, it's, it's not a concept, it, it's a non-existing concept. But today we have a mosque, we have three female imams who on shift call to prayer, lead the prayer and disseminate the Islamic message. And in that sense, we are manifesting the feminine through our activism. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, same question to Karen Georgia. I think when it comes to um, when it comes to activism, um, particularly now in the African descendant communities, um, there is um, some sense of of reaching back um, across tradition um, to find, I think, what is needed for this moment, which is a particular resilience. And I think that resilience um, is about affirming um, who we are as African descendant people, particularly when you look in places like the United States where uh, racism still continues to be um, a challenge and highly problematic. When you look across the Caribbean where um, colonialism still continues to be um, an oppressive footprint um, and affects the lives of people, then what it says is that um, we need to be able to look to our foremothers and our forefathers um, for, um, for what it is that we need. And I think that there's a particular resilience that shows up um, in, in who we are as, as women. Um, and that um, quite often, um, even in, in the church, um, you find that the leadership, um, even if the pastor is male, that the people who are doing the work, who are at the heart of ministry are women. Um, so there's, so there's that, that part of it as well, right? Um, so, so when we, we talk about leadership and how that shows up, there's, um, there's a way in which um, I think that, that women have, have always shown up um, and, and, and have um, in, in many ways, have had to be subversive about um, how um, how we how we own power and how we um, how we um, operate in spaces, right? So that's one example about that kind of um, female subversion. So I think that if you if you link that um, that way in which um, we've had to um, advocate for our families even in spaces that have not acknowledged our power or um, advocate for ourselves as women in workspaces and workplaces that um, have diminished our livelihood and our personhood um, and, our, and our place, right? That, um, that we have had to be um, resilient, persistent, and oftentimes subversive just to be and to show up as who we are. That is what activism looks like, because activism says that we have to find ways to, um, to address systems and powers that don't validate our presence or seek to um, empower or promote who it is that we are. 
So in this moment of activism, I think that, um, you know, um, we look to, um, to women like, um, like Sojourner Truth or, um, you know, others who have been um, parts of historic movements, women who, um, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the U.S. context, um, where women who, who, who moved the civil rights movement who um, helped to emancipate, forcefully emancipate um, men and women who were enslaved. And in, um, in our Jamaican tradition, we have our national heroes, as we call them. And um, it took a number of years. Originally, there were five, and they were all men. Now I think we're up to seven. Um, and Nanny is counted among them. And Nanny was a Maroon woman who, um, who was a freedom fighter. Um, so we have those places that call us into looking at this moment, right, and what it calls for us currently um, to stand up to systems and powers that are rooted in, in the hegemonic um, um, uh, worldview that we already talked about, um, but continue to oppress and suppress um, female living, female voice, female presence. And so um, in this moment, it is helpful for us to begin to um, to own the divine feminine, and those are the places that I look to in my own activism um, as a leader in the church and as a person in this world. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I I think it's you have to laugh uh, or, or cry at the idea that to heal, harmonize, and challenge as a woman is a subversive act, right? And that's the place that we're, we're in now. But um, thank thank God, the goddess, that there are women who are doing this. And I think the Maria Mosque is a beautiful example of doing that, the heal, you know, harmonize and challenge. So let's move into um, our final question. Um, and during this, we'll open up the chat, so do get your questions ready. So I'd like to ask uh, both of you, touched upon this slightly but just a, a little bit in more detail for people who are interested you're both in positions of authority in your respective spiritual organizations how did you claim sacred space for yourself and for others and can you see or how do you see as moving toward a, a more egalitarian sacred space um, and karen georgia if i could ask you to to um, open up this Yes. Um, so I, um, I currently serve as um, one of the elected officers in the United Church of Christ, which is a mainline denomination here in the United, in, here in the United States, um, progressive um, also in that, um, and probably more on the, um, the, the far left in terms of progressive Christianity. Um, and um, I, I think for me, um, claiming sacred space for myself means showing up as who I am, um, which is important. Um, I, I have to say that, that particularly going back to that subversion, right? Um, some of that means that um, um, we, have to, we have to show up in ways that are acceptable um, to, uh, or deemed normative um, for the spaces that we occupy. And I think that a part of, um, of what I understand for myself and hold for myself is that um, who I am as a spiritual being um, is a representative of the divine and the divine feminine in that. And what that requires of me is that I show up in my authentic self. So this is my authentic self. And my authentic self means that um, I've, I function um, in a multiplicity of understandings of myself. Um, that multiplicity of identity is rooted in, um, in my self understanding, both as somebody who lives and functions um, in African American culture, but whose roots are very clearly um, identified in, um, in a Jamaican heritage and cultural understanding and the extended multiplicity of what it means to hold African ancestry in diaspora um, interrupted by um, the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so, so that's a part of it 
for me as well. So it's claiming those identities, um, um, showing up um, and, and speaking my truth um, when, um, whenever um, that is invited. And this is a space that allows me to, to be present in that way. But um, actually, this is how I show up every day. Um, and I let other people deal with what that means for them. Um, so I think that, um, that, that authenticity is a big place. And what I find is um, when I walk in the authentic, authentic expression of myself, then um, there are people who will come, come to me because they see me right and 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 being able to see the other is something important because we see in many different ways and seeing is not just a physical thing seeing is also spiritual so um so we see people and so when we are in our authentic expression people see us in that way and it invites their questions and it invites them then to be themselves and to live into their full authenticity. And as a leader, particularly in the church um, and in a space where um, we continue to, um, to, to wrestle, I think, in many ways with um, what it means to hold and invite indigenous um, expressions to be present or to hold in a predominantly Christian um, um, society what it means to make space for other religious faiths to be present in their authenticity as well. It means that my multiplicity and my way of understanding the world is a place that becomes invitational to others to be who it is that the divine has called them to be in this moment, because we're all on a journey and this is who we are and how we understand um, creator today in this moment um, and if we are authentic to the journey then it means that we will continue to transform and we will continue to learn and understand more about the universe present around us mm, thank you thank you so much um, really resonating what you're saying about when when we can be more authentic you know it's we're standing within ourselves but other people see it right so they see you, but also they, they feel seen. I think when we are able to stand in our authenticity, other people feel seen in a way perhaps that in the hegemonic worldview, as we keep talking about, we're not really allowed to see each other or even ourselves. Um, Shireen, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. Um, as I said earlier, um, uh, to start a mosque with the female imams, it, it was not an idea we had four years ago in 2016. It was, um, it was a vision that was, um, that was nourished since uh, 2000, since August 2000. It took us 16 years to reach where we are today. And I never, I never expected myself to lead a mosque with female imams. It, it was something that just happened slowly. And I think that all of us in the mosque, because we are a group of Muslim activists, both men and women, I think that slowly we grew into the role as religious leaders. And I'm not the only one. We are several religious uh, leaders in the mosque and we don't have a hierarchy. We're all equal. And we don't have an, Im an imam education in Denmark. So since we don't have an imam education, we have to rely on the Western educational system. So in the Maria mosque, since we like we uh, um, constructed the mosque from the from 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 nothing, we also made our own standards. And and when you start a mosque with female imams, people they ask you from where do you get your legitimacy? And male imams, of course, they don't get the same question. But as a woman imam, you always get that question: from where do you get your legitimacy? And my legitimacy is based on knowledge. It's based on need, people seeking us, people seeking the mosque, and it's based on Islamic theology. As I said before, female imams is not a new phenomenon. It's not a reformation. It's a part of the Islamic tradition. We have female imams at the time of the prophet. Uh, we have mosques with female imams all over the world, uh, in China since the 1820, in US, in Canada, in Switzerland, in Germany, France, UK. 
uh, Finland recently, women inspire other women. Like we were inspired by other women. We today inspire other women to do the same. And, and it creates a, a beautiful domino effect because you, you witness the activism. And when you witness the activism, it makes you, it makes you certain that it's possible to do the same. And I think that's the greatest the tool to create change when you witness something that is possible. And um, so the question of legitimacy, of course, is important. And uh, when it comes to uh, knowledge in the Maria Mosque, we set our own standard. You have to, you have, to have a master in, in Islamic studies or theology or religion or Arabic studies or a PhD. Uh, you have to master the art of talking to people. Um, it's called Islamic spiritual care without judging, without, um, it, 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 um, it's, it's like cognitive psychotherapy. It's, it's, it's almost the same method. You don't judge people, you listen on their premises. And I think being a female or being a Muslim leader, it, it's mostly about, you know, being able to talk to people on their premises. Um, then there are other things you have to do. You have to be able to perform marriages, divorces, etc. So in the Maryam Mosque, we distinguish between an imam in a narrow sense. We have women leading the prayer um, and calling to prayer. So they are imams in a narrow sense. And then we have female imams in a broader sense where you have to be able to, to do the whole package. And it's, it's a trial error process and it is a process and we are all in that process. No, nobody is perfect and we are all learning because it, it's new to all of us. And we have only been, the mosque have been implemented for four years now. I remember when, uh, when I was supposed to lead the, when I led the first Friday prayer, I was in my house and I was putting on actually this white galabia that I'm wearing today. It's, um, it's a present from my father from Damascus and I converted it into my imam address. And I was putting on my galabia and my scarf and my four children were watching me. And my youngest daughter at that time, Halima, she was five years old. She had uh, a friend visiting our house, a non-Muslim uh, Danish girl. And she whispered in my daughter's ears, uh, what is an imam? And then my daughter, Halima, she said like with, with a very proud voice, don't you know uh, an imam is a woman who's doing great things? So it, I was really... Um, I was really happy about her answer and I realized that it, it is possible to change a narrative that have been uh, patriarchal uh, for, for so many years in a five-year-old's mind. So I, I, I think that uh, today, four years later, we have gained uh, legitimacy uh, in the Danish communities. Other more traditional mass communities are cooperating with us because they can see that we are not doing anything dangerous. We are calling to prayer. We are leading the prayer, marrying people. But um, I didn't have a chance to say it before, but we have like two main battles uh, that has a specific focus on the feminine and the rights of the uh, rights of women. It's women's right to divorce and women's right to interfaith marriage. And you can ask me about this uh, in the session now if you want to know more about it because that's our true battle. And as, as uh, you know, I realized since I started four years ago that some of the most acute dilemmas among the Muslim youth today are the question about interfaith marriage and also the question about the women's lack of right to divorce. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, such beautiful, amazing work um, that is happening. And I was particularly struck by the idea that, you know, something that you don't normally get um, in, in the current um, state of affairs, not just in Islam, perhaps in others, but I can definitely know from experience within Islam, is the importance of communication skills for a leader of the community, for an imam, is um, so lacking. And there are lots of organizations that are working to this. But I think what is particularly feminine about the way that you spoke is that it is a trial and error process and none of us are perfect, but you're allowing the space for women who want to try and you know, recite, um, do the call to prayer. 
and doing it in a safe space where they can hear each other and have it reflected back. And I just thought, again, this speaks really beautifully to what Karen Georgia was saying about being authentic. If you're allowed that space to be authentic, then beautiful things can happen. So um, it's wonderful. And we've got questions coming through. I've got some that have been coming through privately to me as well. Um, let's start. Um, so Farouk asked a question. Um, Farouk, I'm going to give you the option if you'd like to come on, come on and speak or share your video and ask your question. Just sent you a request to unmute. Stay muted, no problem at all. Okay, so the question is, um, Shireen, you mentioned three early Muslim women Imams. Um, could you elaborate more about them, what they did and how they led? And if we just allow, again, uh, roughly about four to five minutes for answering the questions, that'd be great. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there is uh, uh, Ibn Saad, he was a historian from the 8th century and he has written a biographical lexicon called Kitab al-Tabakad al-Kabir. It consists of eight volumes. Uh, the seven volumes are hadith collections about the men who followed the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, peace be upon him. And the eighth volume is only about the women who followed the Prophet. And it is within this eight volume in Kitab al-Tabakad al-Kabir that you will find uh, these hadith stories about uh, women who were acting as warriors, as teachers, but also as female imams. Um, the hadith uh, mentions uh, mention uh, uh, Um Salama uh, and, and uh, Um Waraka and Aisha. So, um, so these are the three women who are mentioned in these hadith collections. And uh, Aisha and Um Salama led the prayer after the death of the Prophet in the house mosque, just after the Prophet died. So they led the prayer for other women on shift. And when it comes to Umaraka, who the Prophet appointed while he was alive, uh, there are different opinions uh, among Muslim scholars whether she led the prayer for women only or for both men and women, for her household consisting of both men and women. Through these hadith collections, we can see clearly that her house mosque was a more official mosque in the sense that two people called to prayer from the mosque. So, um, but it's evident that at least three women were acting as female imams and that they were leading the prayer. And this is also the reason why three out of four Islamic law schools allow women calling, leading the prayer for other women. Um, and there are also Muslim scholars, uh, Tabari, uh, uh, Ibn Arabi, and others who who are for female imams. So it, it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually uh, legitimate according to, to the Islamic tradition. But if you want to read more, you should look up uh, this source that I, I, I spoke about, Ibn Saad's uh, Kitab al-Tabakad al-Kabir. What happened was that when the Prophet died in 632, um, after when Omar came to power in 634, um, after Abu Bakr, Omar, he denied women to lead the prayer for other women. So, he, and he said that the, the, the prayer is not obligatory for women and they were not allowed to lead the prayer anymore for other women. So when we witness today Muslim leaders and Muslim communities and, and some Muslims saying that denying women the basic right to call to prayer, lead the prayer, I, I think it's because they are following in the footsteps of Omar and not in the footsteps of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. Thank you so much. And also just really quickly, um, where is the quote from Ibn Arabi, the perfect man is a woman? Um, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, he, uh, Ibn Arabi has written the Meccan Revelations, so you will find it there. He has also written a book called Fusuz al-Hikam, uh, I don't know the English translation, The Bezels of Wisdom, I think, I think it's actually translated. So it's, it's, as I said, the quotation is, it's my father's interpretation of Ibn Arabi, 
but I'm sure that you will find a very similar uh, quotation in the Meccan Revelations. Mm, thank you so much. Okay, we have a, another question that's come through to me privately, and I'd like to uh, um, ask both of you to share some thoughts about this. Um, it's referring to sharing the story that uh, you did about God's mercy, and the room um, was really beautiful. And I'd like to ask you both um, if you could share some thoughts on how women who don't bear children or don't have a womb can connect to this idea. And I'd like to ask uh, Karen Georgia if you'd like to um, start off. Yes, um, and, and I think that um, there are those um, things that are distinctly connected to who we are as women. Um, childbearing, um, womb, um, but I think that there's so much more to um, to who we are as women that also informs um, our understanding of the feminine. Um, and I think it's important for us to reach into those places. So um, we have, um, if we look at the LGB LGBTQIA spectrum, we will find that there's a fluidity to gender identification um, so that um, uh, issues of, 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 of how we understand um, feminine are, are somewhat tied to our own self-identification. Um, so, um, so for example, when we talk about transgendered women, um, then um, that means something particular. Um, and for some of those women, um, what we look at in terms of female body parts are not there, right? But it's an embodiment um, of, of the feminine that, that creates that kind of self-identification. So I think that there are polarities to, um, um, to how we understand um, um, the feminine, um, and again, if we go to the masculine and the feminine as a, as a unified whole um, and step away from a dualistic construct, then it says that all of us embody masculine and feminine and that um, the womb um, and childbearing are certainly a part of what it means um, to hold um, feminine identity or to, um, to connect with um, the divine. But it says that um, we also need to begin to pull apart um, those expressions of womanhood if we are to e embrace the full spectrum of what it means to identify into our femininity and our womanness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen Georgia. Shiri, um, same question. Um, how can we connect? to these concepts for women who perhaps don't bear children or don't have a room? Um, I, I agree with uh, Karen Georgia. I believe that um, the feminine can be captured in so many different multiplied ways. And I, I actually don't believe that, um, that men and women are complementary uh, parts that um, I believe that both um, contain the feminine and the masculine. My father, he has so many, what I would call in a traditional sense, feminine attributes. And my mother, she's cool, calm and collected. And what we normally like um, identify as the feminine. So I think it's important to turn it upside down. And, um, and I think both gender contains the same. Um, when, when you give birth to a child, I gave birth four times. It, and and you cut the what do you call it in English? Now listen no one, you know. Oh, yes, when you cut it, it's um, I think it, it's 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 a very important symbolic act, and it's important to the woman and to the man, to the mother and to the father. And the father, he's not with, he's not carrying the child, but he's witnessing uh, the childbirth, and he still has the same you know, connection to, to God and to the sacred and, 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 but, so I think that, you know, when we cut that, it's, it's a symbolic act that we as men and women, as mother and father, and uh, no matter if you witness the act or you are um, delivering it, both have to realize that 
um, the person, the child that comes from you is something distinct from you. And, and I think that's the most important lesson. And this is what brings us closer to God is the understanding that, that God has created a world of multiplicity because God wants us to want multiplicity so as to understand God's unity. And um, our children are different from us and we have to accept it and respect it then we do not owe our children. I, I think that's the greatest lesson uh, when, you, when you give birth. And, and I think if, if you witness that act as well, you will also be, to be able to, to, to see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I can attest as somebody who, who hasn't had children, um, but I'm an auntie to many. And, uh, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on an outer level, I can, I can hand them back, right? <laughs> and I get to just be, you know, kind of do the cool stuff. But this exploration of the Divine Feminine, um, you know, for, for Fatima and I have had lots of conversations about this it really starts to look deeper beyond these outer understandings of what it is to be a woman, to give birth, to be a mother, um, you know, to be mothering in different social constructs. But what is it within ourselves? What are we nurturing? And reconnecting to what is the divine mother, um, especially if we've grown up with a patriarchal understanding of God and reconnecting to the, the feminine aspects within that too. So I just want to uh, say at this moment that if uh, some friends are not able, don't know where their chat is, I forgot to say before, if you want to ask a question, please do raise your hand as well. Um, I'm going to um, jump in here and ask a question, which um, I'd love to hear about from both of you, is what advice would you give to women who are interested in pursuing a path of spiritual leadership? You've both done this um, in, your, you know, in your respective organizations. Is there... Can you look back now and think, you know, um, yeah, that wasn't so great. You know, you'd recommend to somebody uh, jump, that, jump that hurdle. Here's the way to do it. Um, and just some words of encouragement and advice on how to do that. Uh, Karen, Georgia? I would start by saying, know yourself. <laughs> um, and um, that's, that seems um, simple, but that's a journey too. Um, I came out of a, of a Christian tradition um, where women were not allowed to speak in the church. Women were supposed to be silent. Um, only men could speak. Um, that's what I grew up um, in as a child. And so um, when I heard the call to ministry, um, I didn't have any context for what it meant to be um, a female minister. Um, I didn't, um, and because I was brought up in that way, um, I had my own pushback to what I was hearing as God's call for me to be in ministry. Um, so, um, so it was, um, it was something of a challenge for me to then own that, um, and I had my own variations on spin of on, on how I could do it and, and, and not um, kind of um, push against um, how I was raised. And um, my mother, God bless her heart, may she rest in peace, um, for years would say, um, when I would preach, she would say, oh, so are you speaking on Sunday? And I would say, yes, I'm preaching. And she told me the story one day that, um, um, my mother was a very conservative Christian. And um, one day she told me um, that, and this was after I'd been in ministry for many years. She said that um, she had prayed and asked God to, um, to make one of her preachers a son. And she had been praying very hard about that. And so um, one day she was sitting in church um, and she was listening to me preach and God said, there is the preacher that you asked for. So, um, you know, um, we, we have these ways that shape us, but I would say for women, um, particularly, um, have, um, have your sources of support because those are not necessarily found in institutions. Um, know and understand your purpose, um, and be willing, um, to walk into it. Um, and the third I would say is um, 
recognize that the presence of God is with you. Um, so even in those moments where it feels as if you're bereft of support, um, and even you yourself might um, have doubts about um, whether or not this is something you should be doing because it's painful, um, because of the pushbacks um, and supports, um, you know, what that means is that you have to know yourself, which is where I started, and you have to know your call, and you have to know your relationship with the divine, and those are things that you have to know for yourself, because oftentimes the external affirmation that we need um, as women in spiritual, serving in spiritual leadership is not forthcoming, especially when we need it. So we need to be able to find that internally and to do our own reflection um, and, and have spiritual practices that ground you, whether that's daily or weekly, but make sure that you understand what your routines are, what your rituals need to be, and what grounds you. And when you can, walk outside barefooted because it connects you back to God. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I love that sharing of your mother's. What I, just, I was just imagining you know, how she must have felt sitting there witnessing you and having this, you know, this revelation come. How beautiful. Shireen, same question. Um. Yeah, all the beautiful things have been said uh, by Karen Georgia, but um, I, I think that you have to find uh, your source of strength, ex except from worshiping God. You have to find something that is very light, very concrete, uh, like a source of strength. And to me, that's the ocean. I, I swim in the ocean every morning, uh, all year round, and it, it gives me a certain kind of strength. Uh, and I feel very connected and close to God when I swim in the ocean alone in the morning. And um, also, I think you have to master the art of losing. Um, because when you are challenging a patriarchal structure, and when you're challenging status quo, of course, you will be met by opposition. So you have to be ready to tackle opposition. And the way my strategy in order to tackle opposition is to um, never to focus on it. So I always tell, I always share and tell the stories of support. I tell the stories of the grand imam who came all the way from Indonesia, uh, who represents uh, the Istiqlal Mosque, where he has 200,000 uh, uh, visitors for the Friday prayer. And he came and he blessed our mosque and he prayed in the mosque. And I made him write uh, a written statement where he wrote, female imams is a blessing. Um, so you need to tell the stories of support and remind yourself of all the supporters because there are a lot of support out there and, and, and not focus too much on the opposition. In, in my case, um, I, I lost my marriage when I, not because I, I became one of the female imams in the mosque, but because I was conducting interfaith marriages. And to my ex-husband, uh, who's the father of my four children, we had been married for 13 years, um, he said that to him, that was a game changer. And, and no, that was a deal breaker. <laughs> it's also a game changer, but it was, it was a deal breaker to him. He said that one thing is that you as a private person, um, uh, give, your, give your blessing to, in, to the concept of interfaith marriage. And I mean Muslim women marrying non-Muslim, because in the Quran, it's stated clearly that a Muslim man can marry people from the book, Jews or Christians. But it's not stated clearly that a woman can do the same, and it's not stated that she can't. So we use that as our legitimacy. Um, that Allah has created a world of multiplicity and that men and women are equal and that they have the same rights and possibilities in this world. So what God allows for the man, he allows for the woman as well. But uh, my ex-husband, he said that it was a deal breaker and he asked me to choose between uh, our family or conducting the interfaith marriage. He, he wanted me to leave the mosque and uh, to focus on the exit circle uh, a secular NGO where I work with uh, women and violence. It has nothing to do with the Maria Mosque. And to me, that was not an option. Um, 
because he said that when you conduct interfaith marriages, and today we have conducted more than 55 Islamic marriages between Muslim women and non-Muslims. So he said, when you do that, you are, you are changing the future and you are allowing this and you are promoting this. And, and he, 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 he couldn't be a part of that. Um, so you have to be able to tackle a position from outside and from within, and you have to be able to endure and to master the art of losing. And, and, to, uh, and of course, to know who you are and to be very um, aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it and what is the greater purpose of what you're doing. Um, I myself, I have two girls and two boys and my two girls are today nine and 16. And what are the chances that my two girls will grow up one day and fall in love with a non-Muslim? It, it's huge because we live in Denmark, we live in Europe. But the father of my children, he would say that it's never going to happen because he, um, he raised his children so well that they will not even dream about falling in love with a non-Muslim as girls, as women, when they become women. And you hear the same opinion uh, among Jewish leaders, some Christian leaders, you, you, I mean, you will find these opinions within all religions, the idea that one religion is superior to another religion. And this is actually, to me, the essence. This is not only about interfaith marriage, this is about something greater. Uh, I do believe that all the roads lead to the same God. And I do believe that if you deny uh, another religion, you deny the source of everything, which is God. And, and so, to, so to me, this battle is extremely important and, and, and I'm very confident that I'm walking on the path of, of justice. Everything starts in the name of love. Everything is centered and circled around love. And if you don't have the basic right as a Muslim woman to choose your love partner for life, then you have nothing, absolutely nothing. There is no hope. And so to me, that's one of the most important, um, most important uh, part of our activism. And I'm very happy and proud to be able to promote it and to conduct it. And we have couples coming from all over the world to get married in the Maria Mosque from UK, France, uh, Arabic countries, other European countries, uh, Scandinavia, because they're not able to, to have someone to conduct the Islamic marriage um yeah what was the question oh <laughs> the question? yeah no that answered it beautifully yeah no absolutely and actually just just um i think segueing from what you just shared about about marriage um Farouk was also asking a follow-up question that you'd mentioned the two issues that you face um with with uh, your mosque and uh, divorce being one of them and um, he was asking if you could elaborate on the challenges that that you face. I mean, you've, you've already touched upon it a lot. Um, yes. That you want to say about that specifically in relation to how you, how people come to you in re relation to divorce. Yes. Um, in Denmark and in many European countries and also in the rest of the world, uh, Muslim women do not have the basic right to Islamic divorce, even though it's stated clearly in several verses in the Quran that a Muslim woman have, she ha he, she has the right to divorce and a man has not the right to hold her against her will in a marriage, and she's also allowed to remarry after she divorces. Even though it's stated clearly, we have normalized the patriarchal structure where only the man is allowed or able to give the talaq, the divorce. If a woman wants a divorce, it's called a hula, and the process around the hula is very difficult. Uh, uh, there has to be a kind of reconciliation process the woman has to speak to her husband and they have to recon uh, they have to have someone to reconcile between the couple and if the husband refuses it's often very difficult for the woman to divorce so in Denmark we have women who is stuck in the religious marriages that they cannot escape because the husband refuses to divorce her even though she's divorced according to Danish legislation she can't have the Islamic divorce and what we have done in the Maria Mosque is that we have, uh, we have made an Islamic marriage contract where it is stated clearly that 
Polygamy is forbidden. If mental or physical violence occur, the marriage is annulled. Um, the woman have the right to divorce. Like the man, she can give the divorce without the consent of the husband. But most importantly, we have stated in our marriage contract that if you, if you want an Islamic marriage, you have to be married according to Danish legislation. And if you are divorced according to Danish law, you are immediately divorced Islamically. So our aim is to find ways to standardize this contract because only very few mass communities in Denmark give women the right to divorce in the contract and the rest they do not. So, and I think it's, it, it, it's, it's very easy to change this um, patriarchal uh, tradition. We just need to have the religious leader, um, they have to be aware of the contract and have, they have to give women the right to divorce in the contract. And they, I think they have to make the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, symbiose between uh, European legislation and, uh, and Islamic guidance in order to secure the women. Mm, thank you so much. Yes. Um, oh, so much more that we could say on this, but I'm, I'm going to move on to another question um, that in relation to marriages and uh, for both of you, what, how do you deal with um, LGBTQ plus relationships or marriages within your community and perhaps I could ask Karen Georgia to start us off on that. So um, in the United Church of Christ as I mentioned um, we are a progressive um, denomination and so um, we um, support um, same gender um, relationships and, um, and marriage and in fact um, in 2005 um, our General Synod did pass a resolution supporting um, same, same gender marriage, which at the time was controversial. And um, there were many who left the denomination at that time. Um, and we were well ahead of um, the marriage equality um, laws in the United States. Um, so at so the time- I to you, Karen Georgia. Did you say 2005? Wow. Okay. Yeah, so we, so we passed um, that in 2005 and have continued to live in it, into it. Um, so we've always supported um, the LGBTQIA community. Um, it, I, um, I, one of my children is transgendered. Um, and so um, personally, um, that is important to me um, to be in religious spaces um, and places that are going to support um, those aspects and part of who I am. So um, for me, it's important to be in a denomination um, where um, my children can be their authentic selves and walk in the full expression of who they are. I think the other piece is that, you know, for, um, for, for many indigenous um, communities, there's an understanding of the way in which the divine shows up. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and that piece about duality is not as prevalent, right? Um, so in some traditions, we talk about two spirit people. Um, and, um, and those kinds of ways um, of owning um, or um, even um, um, understanding that people who own um, um, that way of moving in the world as LGBTQIA outside of this gender, um, of, uh, outside of a heteronormative um, way of being, that um, that they're held in high regard um, and seeing as seen as deeply spiritual people. So I just want to put that out there as well. Um, so so that becomes very important, um, both personally and professionally for me in terms of um, being able to honor um, the fullness of the LGBTQIA spectrum, which plus because um, we continue to learn more each day about what it means to move um, uh, beyond, um, again, that um, dualism of masculine and feminine, but also rooting that in a heteronormative um, male-female um, relationship um, construct, which continues to be problematic and oppressive for many. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that um, from a personal perspective too. Sherry? Thank you so much, Karen Georgia, for your words. Um, we in the Maryam Mosque, we had our first uh, request for same gender, ma gender marriage. Um, it was in uh, 2019 and 
unfortunately, I was uh, in, a, in a big dilemma because I knew I wasn't able to conduct the Islamic marriage uh, because we decided in the board that we cannot carry all the battles on our shoulders. Um, so instead, I, uh, I went to the wedding um, re representing myself, but also uh, as the imam, and I gave a speech to the couple as a part of the ceremony, but not marrying them at the same time. So it was my way of showing officially that I fully support same, gen same gender marriage. I fully support love. I believe that love is above everything. It's above gender. It's above anything. Um, but as I said, we cannot carry all the battles on our shoulders. If we do, uh, we will lose our legitimacy and we won't be able to do all the battles concerning inter interfaith marriages and divorces because you can only carry a certain amount on your shoulder. But I, I all, all in our board support uh, same gender marriage and we also support it officially and we make conferences and discussing this topic and then we cooperate with uh, other imams in different places in the world that uh, conducts uh, same gender marriage. There is a Ludovic in France, but of course you have to travel to France in order to have your marriage. Um, so it's problematic still that we don't have a Muslim organization yet in Denmark that conducts uh, the same gender marriage. But in the future, we hope that we'll be strong enough and have a stronger fundament and that the other battles are have become more normalized, so we will be able to take more battles. Thank you so much, Shireen. Um, I just deeply, deeply admire and appreciate the fact that um, you are trying to manage all the, the far too many battles that we have to do in religious spaces. And I really hope that one day soon, you'll be able to offer this to the people that are really looking for it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're coming towards the end of our session, so I would just like to um, say thank you to everybody that submitted questions that we haven't got around to. Perhaps we can forward them onto our speakers and provide um, a platform where we can share them um, afterwards uh, on our website. But I would just like to now come back to Karen Georgia, who is going to share a poem. And I realised I didn't actually ask you, um, Karen Georgia, which poem you were going to share. Um, You sh you sh is that share? Oh, that's, that's answering the two spirit yeah, question. Yes, I just answered the two spirit question. Um, the, the poem that I am going to share is actually called um, Faith Journey. And um, I actually posted it on, um, on Instagram uh, a couple of minutes ago since we've been here, because I thought since I was going to use it, I would post it. And I actually tagged it um, Rayfest 20. Um, so people could find it if they um, if they want to. Um, my my poetry on Instagram is actually um, K G A T poetry, um, and um, and I also have a Facebook page. Um, so um, so that's usually where I um, I post um, poems. Um, so so you could find it there. And like I said, I I tagged it for Rayfest. So um, I want to close out with this poem, um, which, um, which I hope inspires. Um, okay, so faith journey. Hear the voices of the ancestors. Come home, child, come home. There's the call to rituals past and invitation to learn the ocean's secrets unknown. Return to the blue skies they call. Come walk our mountains and learn. Remember who you are. You are a child of these seas. Come, child, come on home. The voices of the ancestors call again. Child, listen to each drumbeat. The universe speaks in mysterious ways. Receive of old wisdom to walk these challenging days. Return to the stories of the grandparents. Survival, success, impossibilities. Remember who you are. Find your way home to the deepest knowing. Live life. Hear the drum beat. Hear the ancestors speak. Child, read the prophetic skies. Wisdom carried on the rolling clouds. Give yourself to the peace you crave inside and out. 
Return to the chants that fill your soul. Taste the earth, read the waves. Remember who you are. You are a child of the stars. Have faith, read the skies. The voices of the ancestors rise. Child, touch the wisdom of the trees. Thousands of years held in their trunks. Fill your fingers and hands with their, with their ancient healing. Return to the dreams that kept you awake. Smell the revealing sands of time. Remember who you are. You were born to speak boldly with souls. Reach out, touch the healing. The voices of the ancestors cry, child, breathe earth's fire. Inhale the memories of generations gone. Live into your destiny, for this you were born. Return to the spirits who sent you. Feel the urgency of now. Remember who you are. You were born to swim deep, fly high, breathe the fire. Hear the invitation of the ancestors. Child, come, ride the wind. Believe you are possible. You are the universe, the earth, water, wind, and fire. Return to yourself. Grasp the joy that abounds. Remember who you are. Seeing the unseen, come ride the wind. Ashe. Thank you. That was magnificent. Definitely do recommend everybody go or post a link um, to that page as well on Instagram. Thank you so much. Well, it's been absolutely phenomenal. I wish we had uh, the whole day just to spend with you both, but um, you know, it'd be wonderful to have you back at some point as well. Thank you both so much for joining us.